Hello, alright, I'm your professor, Steve Wall, this is Economics 1010. Chapter 5, Supply Decisions. Alright, I'm going to give you a quick rundown of it. Let's go through, okay? At the bottom, you can see our learning objectives. It's all going to be about supply decisions. Number one, we're going to look at production functions, okay? We're going to look at the law of diminishing returns. We're going to nature of fixed variable and marginal cost. So we have a lot of costs when you end up building stuff. We're going to try and divide those out so you can kind of see how those work. And the difference between production and investment decisions. And finally, accounting costs versus economic costs and how they differ, okay? Let's go through this. Basically, we're just going to talk all about supply and how, you, how supply works in economics, okay? A lot, a lot of those decisions, okay? Um, again, going back to Chapter 3, supply is the ability and willingness to produce, okay? So you have to be able and willing. And you sell specific quantities of a good at alternative prices, okay? And again... We always say at a given time period and with everything else remaining the same. Okay, that's how we'd calculate what supply is. Remember, it's main thing you have to remember, willing and able. That means that you're able to have supply there. Okay, and, and they'll have it for different price points. That's all they're telling you with the specific quantities. Okay, at all current price points. Um, business use. Factors of production is inputs produce goods and service. So, as we remember in chapter one, it takes things to make stuff. Okay, we get inputs and we make things called outputs okay that outputs production the question is what's the most efficient way to get these outputs or, or inputs to make decent outputs okay what's the most efficient thing okay um and then overall it's going to take land labor capital and entrepreneurship and depending on how you change that combination some ways are more effective than others okay and also just based on your business you have a business very land intensive you have a business very labor intensive you have a business very capital intensive or you can have a business that just really doesn't take much people, but it takes a lot of good management to make sure it runs well. Okay, so you have different things going there. Factory production are the economic costs produced. Okay, so that's what we have to use to produce things. Um, production function is a technological relationship expressing the maximum quantity of good attainable from different combination of factor outputs. I.e., what they're trying to tell you is they're going to look at all the factors going into it and try to figure out what's coming out. That's all it is. Okay. They're going to see what's the maximum that you can get. Um, and basically, you're going to have these inputs, and you're going to be able to adjust them to see what would give you the right output that you need. Okay? Um, as far as outputs go, labor is probably the easiest. Okay? If I'm running a pizza shop, some guy shows up, we're not busy, and I tell him go home. All right? Let's say the Super Bowl is going on. I need a lot more people. I'm going to say, hey, I need everybody here today. We've got a lot of work to get done. I need a lot more labor to get this stuff going. Okay, it's, it's adjustable daily. You can adjust it in the short run. You can adjust it in the long run by hiring and firing employees completely. Very easily adjustable, okay? Other inputs, not so much, but labor is very adjustable. Um, here's a short run production function. So we look over here, it says labor input workers per day. It says output pairs of genes per day. We're looking at a gene factory, obviously. And if you have no one working, surprise, surprise, at A, then you're not going to get any genes from that factory, okay? It's not completely automated. <laughs> so when we go to B, if one person puts at least one hour in there, okay, all of a sudden we're getting 15 pairs of genes. And then when we have two people working there, we have 34. So per person, that's more than 15, okay? That, that, we're looking at about 17 genes per person. We have two. So what's that mean? We added more people for that little segment from one to two, it became more efficient. So maybe one guy sitting there cutting the material, another person sewing. And so because they're able to specialize in what they're doing, they became more efficient. <clears throat> but what happened when we, go, when we go to D? Okay, D we add in another hour. Okay, labor input, workers per day. So I'm mean, sorry, not hour, but actually an actual worker. Okay. And basically, when you have three workers at a time, that third worker is only letting you produce an extra 10 pair of genes, okay? Well, that's not as efficient, okay? In fact, from A to B, we had 15. From B to C, we had a jump of 19. And then from C to D, it was only 10. So all of a sudden, we're still making more, but we're not as efficient, okay? So people are probably running into each other. We're having bottlenecks as far as people needing to use different machines, and there's people waiting around to do stuff, okay? Um, on E, we go from D to E. Okay, we had another worker in there. He's able to help a little bit, but you're only producing four more pairs of genes at that point. And then from E to F, that factory is getting really crowded, and you're going from four to five, and that guy's only helping you produce two extra pairs of genes. And then from F to G, 
you're at basically max input. You're like everyone's here can do what what they can. We're not really producing that much. We have a whole lot of bottlenecks everywhere as production. We're at 51. Now this is what's interesting with this. With and this happens all the time with factory. People don't realize this. From G to H, six to seven, it goes down. The extra person can't do any work. What what ends up happening? Person becomes a distraction. Person gets in the way. You actually become less productive. Okay. I'm less productive at that point and even from h to i you're still lower than g so maybe they found some other type of format to use and it's a little bit more productive than from from g to h but still it's diminishing there's no sense to use seven or eight workers because six you're maxed out on and that's only if it's still profitable to produce that okay as far as the cost of that extra worker versus the cost of how much that extra pair of jeans would be you have to look and say well that worker that extra worker cost me ten dollars for that day and the pair of jeans is worth 20 then it's worth hiring that extra worker okay but if that's not the case if that extra output is not equal to the input cost you're not going to do it okay um output depends on how many inputs are used okay so right now remember that big schedule we went through they're going to plot it you see that nice little curve going through okay that's the efficiency curve, okay? So we're getting more efficient, more efficient, more efficient, and then we're starting to reach max efficiency, okay? Actually, we reach max efficiency right away, but I'm saying we reach max output, and then you're gonna go to where you're actually making less, okay? And so you have to really look at it and say, is it worth producing the extra amount? It all depends on how much the outputs can be sold for, okay? And you're, we're gonna go through a lot of those equations later on, but you can see that you also have max output in a factory, okay? And that's what's also interesting. It's like sometimes we're like, hey, if we just hire more workers, we'll get more done. Well, if you have only so many workers that can work on a certain machine at a time, you max out. And also, as we can see from B, C, and D, we're getting pretty good increases per worker, but then it tapers off. Okay. So here, they're looking at pretty good. Okay. Uh, also on this line, if you're ever producing any point that's not on this line, that means people are goofing off okay that's all they're saying it's like you should be at least be producing on this line based on the workers you have and then of course you have the ceiling potential output and then maximum capacity is interesting maximum capacity is how many workers can fit in the factory but that's also that maximum capacity is less than your maximum output so and then yeah anything beyond the ceiling so g was our ceiling we're obviously now inefficient we're not even gaining when we add stuff when we add more work and you've probably seen this all like at fast food restaurants where it's like one worker the guy can barely do anything is trying to keep up with stuff that's going on two workers they get a bit of a system that's fairly efficient you get five workers in there they, they start goofing off <laughs> all right um each worker's contribution output can be quantified this is the one thing you, you can say if i add one worker how much does that person produce for me okay we call this marginal physical product, MPP, okay? Is the change in total output associated with one additional unit of input, okay? So in other words, when I add that last worker, what does that last worker give me? That's what marginal means. Marginal means if I add one more, what do I get more added, okay? So if I added one more person, does that one more person produce one more pair of jeans? They produce two more pairs of jeans? Or is it negative and we actually produce less pairs of jeans? What's the change, okay? So you're looking at change in total output divided by change in input quantity. So sometimes you're not lucky. You're not able to add workers at like one a piece. And so you just have to do the, the, the complete totals. Okay. But it's change in total output versus change in input. That's marginal. You're looking at those changes. Okay. Um, MPP eventually diminishes as we saw on that graph as more of it is employed when other inputs are fixed. So it starts out really efficient and then it starts to taper. Then you reach max, and then you actually get negative. So, and the reason why it normally increases is specialization. Like I said before, people start specializing, things work. If you have one guy trying to run a factory, he wastes a lot of time running from machine to machine, setting up machines. It's just not as effective. Okay. Uh, fixed inputs. Each additional worker is allotted less capital and land. Okay, so this is where we start seeing why did the bottlenecks form? Because we have fixed inputs. Even though I can adjust the labor, okay. I can adjust how many people are working that day, or I can hire and fire people, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the factory doesn't change that day. I can't just say, boom, I want a new factory. It doesn't work that way. Okay, you, you're stuck with that factory for now. 
That'd be a long run decision you'd have to make as far as upgrading the factory, building a second factory, things like that. So you're fixed with that input, so that leads to bottlenecks as far as your labor, okay? As a result, MPP begins to decline, and it can be negative. That's the one thing, it can be negative. Those are the things they want you to really make sure and understand. Um, let's look at this. The limit availability of fixed inputs is the cause of diminishing returns. That's right, because think about it. If we had an unlimited amount of factories <clears throat> we could put people into, as soon as we kept hiring people, we just put them into a new factory that was there waiting for them, then we wouldn't run into bottlenecks. But because we have fixed inputs on those, I don't have all these empty factories to just start putting people into, then we get diminishing returns. Okay, And that's why we get a ceiling, because we, we have fixed inputs we're dealing with. Even though some inputs are fixed, all can be adjusted over time. So that's the one thing. You have short run and long run supply decisions. Short run, do I tell more people to come into work today? Long run, well, do I expand the factory? Okay. Do I buy more machines for our factory? Okay. Those are all long run type things. But anything that I can fix immediately and fast, that would be short run. Okay. Short run is the period of time in which some inputs can't be changed. Okay. So if I can't change it, then it's short run, okay? I can't change a factory. Factory might take me a day. No, no, I'm not, not sorry, not a day. It might take me a week if it's a super small factory and something, I'm just adding one machine. It, if I'm doing a large improvement on the factory, it could take several months. If I'm building a whole nother factory, it could take years, okay? But it, they, they just can't be changed within a given time period, okay? Um, long run is the period of time in which all inputs can be varied, okay? So with long run, everything can be changed in the long run. So short run, they're saying short run, some things can't be changed because it takes time to change things. Long run, everything can be done. Um, production function provides how much a firm could produce, but not how much it will want to produce. Okay, now this is what's really interesting. People can always put their factories at max. They're only going to do that, though, if that additional input creates output that's worth more than the cost of that additional input, okay? So we'll go through that. Overall, you just have to know this, a firm's goal is to maximize profit. If the producing that extra unit is unprofitable, that marginal unit, they look at each marginal unit going up and say, we're gonna produce, 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 and then they get to a point where they produce one more unit and it's no longer profitable, they don't produce that unit, okay? Or should it? <laughs> so profit equals total revenue, Minus total cost. Total cost is the value of all inputs. So that's just a quick thing they're giving you there. Uh, firm set output to maximize profit. So number one, firms do not maximize production. They do not maximize production. They maximize profits. And if that means to maximize production, they'll do that. But if it doesn't, they won't. They have one goal, profit. Okay. Uh, cost of production can be categorized by whether they change when the rate of output is altered. Hmm, that's right. It can change, okay? Fixed costs, however, don't change, okay, with output rate. Uh, they require binding commitments come out more in the short in the short run. So in other words, if you have rent, if you have things that you can't change that are just set in stone to a degree, if you have a long-standing contract, you have to deal with it. There's not much you're gonna be able to work with. Um and then variable costs change with output, okay? Zero if nothing is produced. Okay, so the variable cost, for example, labor. Labor is variable. I can I can change more people in and out, but the building they're in, I'm stuck with that cost. Whether I employ one worker or ten workers, I still have the building cost. Okay, so that's the easiest way to look at a fixed cost. Fixed cost is something I can't change, and I can't like go ahead and change how what it's going to cost me that time. Okay, um, other things that are variable costs would be like actual materials. If I produce more TVs. I'm going to use more plastic. I'm going to use more glass. I'm going to use those things. And as my, as my, I change that variable cost, the output will change with it. Okay. So those will be connected. Fixed cost, whether I produce one TV or a hundred TVs, factory still costs me the same. Let's take a look at this. Okay. Rise in total cost depends on variable cost. Remember, it starts at zero. Okay. And you're seeing these total costs. They're kind of getting spread out. Okay, and then what do we see at the very end? Production costs kind of go through the roof. Okay, what's that mean? It means you're reaching your max. You can't produce more than that. You're not getting anything more. And so that's where you're kind of hitting that max capacity. You're becoming inefficient at that point. Okay, 
And so that's a good way to look at the variable costs on that. Um, fixed cost, okay? The easiest way to find fixed cost is you just find out how much does it cost to produce zero, okay? If I do nothing, what's my fixed cost? Well, if I look at that graph, where's nothing at for A? Well, it's at $100. So if I have no, if I produce nothing and it costs me $100, that's my fixed costs. That's the easiest way to look at fixed costs. And then as I produce, if I go from A to B and from B all the way up to G, as I'm producing more and more, those other costs are the variable costs, okay? So see those two lines there? So remember, below the blue line there, that's your fixed cost. So you see that fixed cost there? You just run that over to the graph till you hit that y-axis, okay? That's when you're producing zero, that's gonna be your fixed cost. So if you produce nothing, you still have to pay this. Therefore, we know it's fixed, okay? You still have to pay rent, whether or not anyone shows up to work. If you have a contract, they don't care. If you, you just have to pay those things, they're fixed, okay? Variable, though, is above, and as our variable costs go up, as you can see that red line, we have more variable costs. We're producing more out here, okay? We're producing more. All right, so total costs are your fixed and variable combined. That's your TC. So total cost equals your fixed and variable combined. Um, one important question is which cost should a firm pay attention to when increasing output? Okay. Um, there's two ways to look at it. You can do average total cost, which is just saying, hey, how efficient are we overall? overall? Or the easiest one, the one that I use the most when I'm working with companies is marginal cost. Okay. Total cost divided by total output. Okay. So I just want to know, is it worth producing one more step? ATC is great. It lets you know how efficient you are overall. MC is really important. That's the one you use the most. Okay. So that way I can say, hey, our total cost went up by 10, but our total output, as far as the value of the output, went by 20. Keep producing. Okay. Um, here's an example of a cost of production table. You see there at rate of output zero. Our fixed costs are 20, so if we have no one working, we still got rent and everything we have to pay, which is 120. Our variable costs are zero, total cost is 120, okay? Then when we go down to I, this is where we start having some things change, okay? We're producing 10 units, okay? So we take our fixed costs, which is 120, plus our variable cost, which is 85, and we get 205, and then they're actually able to divide it, okay? So you take your total cost over there, that 205, and you divide it by how much you actually ended up doing, that's gonna give you your average total cost. That's how much if each single unit would cost if we were to evenly distribute the variable and fixed costs per unit that was done. Um, the thing that's interesting when you look at this, when you look at the fixed cost column, what do you see? What, what do you notice? It never changes. It's still at 120, okay? That 120, it's not changing. It's a fixed cost. However, as we go down, as far as the rate of output and variable, we can see that our, as we get more output going, our variable costs go up, so maybe we have to add more labor, maybe we gotta add more materials, whatever it is, we see that going. And then each time, we're gonna take the total costs on the very right side over here and divide it by that rate of output, okay? So you take the total cost, divide it by the rate of output, and we're gonna keep finding out the average total cost. So we go one more step. Oh well, look, we're becoming more efficient from I to J, okay? We have 15 units of output. Our total cost is now 245. We're looking at 1633 per unit. And then from K, look, from, from J to K, we're getting even more efficient per unit. From K to L, we're, we even got more efficiency per unit. We're at $12 per unit. Um, from L to M, we're at 11.75. Uh-oh, what's gonna happen from M, from M to O? 1340s, what, what's, what happened? We became less efficient per unit at making them. So in other words, we probably ran into overtime. Maybe we had to pay extra to get expedited uh, shipments for supplies that are usable on our products. Whatever it is, it did not become as efficient per product. We're producing more overall, but it's no longer as efficient per product, okay? And then O, okay? Rate of output goes up one, variable costs, okay? Which is interesting, goes to 633, so. They might have changed something on that, it looks like. Yep, yep. So it looks like they did a typo on N and O. Just take a note of that. Textbook publishers make a lot of mistakes on their slides. Um, yeah. That is very interesting. All right, yep.
Actually, no, no, no. I think they might be right. Fixed costs, total costs. No, 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 they're right. They're right. It just still doesn't make sense why the variable cost would go end oh. I guess maybe that's just one of those things where they figured out some other new production. Usually it's a smooth curve. So as far as efficiency, but they have something weird going on. All right, let's move on. They did do the math correctly, though, on that. But it's just a weird curve you wouldn't normally see. Uh, fixed costs do not change with output. Variable costs rise with output. Okay. Um, we can see that. In general, variable costs will rise from N to O. That's an exception for some reason on this graph, so I don't know why they included that on there because it's very, very rare and, and anomaly. So, um, average total cost is U-shaped. Okay. So yeah, average total cost is U-shaped. Mm -hmm. All right. Marginal cost rises. As more workers share fixed inputs, reducing marginal productivity. Okay, so on this one, marginal cost just lets us know whether or not it's worth doing the next step. And we get to know how much it costs for those additional units. So average cost, you're always spreading over everything. Marginal, we just want to know how much do the next units cost. Okay, if I produce two more units, how much do those two more units cost me? So right here, we'll go from H to I. We'll just go straight to I. Okay. Rate of output is 10, total cost is 205. So what they do is, what over here on the equation, we're seeing 85 divided by 10. Where do they get that 85 from? Well, you take your total cost, which is 120. We know that has to be a fixed cost because at zero, that's how much our costs are. So we just take 205 minus 120 gives us $85, okay? $85 is how much it costs to produce those, those new 10 units. So then all you do is divide 85 by 10, those 10 units per piece cost 850, okay? As far as new costs, okay? So that moving that one step, those new units would be 850 a piece, okay? And then you continue this over and over and over. So from H to I, we go from 205 or to 245, okay? So there's a $40 difference there. That rate of output only changed by five. So then we're saying, okay, the new units, we got five more units but it cost us $40 to produce those five new units. So those new units per piece were $8, okay? And just like we saw before with other things, we can see that efficiency curve creep into here, okay? And you keep repeating this. So you see it goes from $8.50 on the right, as far as it cost $8 to $5. And then all of a sudden, boom, the new units go and they cost $9, then $11, then $20. And then from end to O, that last unit costs $83 for that one extra unit, okay? So when we look at that, you're just going to see that curve again. Again, all you do is you look at the change in cost versus the change of output. And that gives you the marginal cost. We just want to know how, for the next new units you produce, what's the actual cost on it, okay? ATC curve has a distinct U shape, okay? Let's look at this shape. Average total cost. Remember how we had that efficiency going in, okay? So when we start out, with ATC at I, we have, we're not producing very much. Therefore, it's going to be pretty high overall average total cost because we're not spreading those variable costs out very much over the fixed. Okay, so the we have a very high fixed cost. We're not spreading out a lot. Okay, but as we go from I to J to K to L, we're now spreading out fixed costs because we're having a lot more variable costs and a lot more overall output. And then we're going to kind of reach that ceiling. And then at which point? It's going to be very inefficient to produce, okay? And that's where you see it go from N to O. Um, it varies with the rate of output. You can see we kind of reached that efficiency point, and then it also goes way high. Uh, marginal cost rises because of the law of diminishing marginal product, okay? So if you see here, that MC is just kind of showing us our basically the cost of the new units. So the new units are getting cheaper on the first three dots. So we go from 10 to, to 15 to 20, and they're getting cheaper per marginal unit. And then all of a sudden, they cost a little bit more per marginal unit, and then it goes crazy at the very end. So again, you can see that efficiency curve in there. Okay. Um, as more workers are added, MPP falls and costs rise. Added output is increasingly expensive to produce when marginal costs are rising. Okay. 
All right, so let's look and categorize into short run and long run decisions, okay? Production decisions of adjusting output rates are made in the short run. So in other words, as far as the output, I can decide how many people I want to hire that day. And I can definitely make those changes pretty easy. Fixed costs, again, they're going to really hammer this in for you. Fixed costs are unavoidable as fixed inputs cannot be adjusted in the short run. So in other words, if I decide I want to sell my factory or I want to build a new factory, it takes time. I can't change it immediately. Um, increase in production, raise marginal costs, okay? So if I have a factory and I decide just to hire more workers there all of a sudden, that's going to increase the marginal cost because I'm going to increase production for that day. Uh, marginal cost is one of the determinants of whether a firm produces more. And that's really simple. They're going to look at the marginal cost. They're going to compare it to, to the marginal uh, revenue they're getting in. And if they're not making more money than what it costs to produce those extra units, they're not going to do it. Um, investment decisions of adjusting fixed inputs are made in the long run. So again, production decisions, for production output, that's a short run thing. Production output, you're looking daily. What am I going to produce daily? What am I going to produce weekly? What am I going to produce monthly? You're looking at a very short term. Okay. Long run, you're usually looking longer. Okay. Usually you're looking at past a month in general. But overall, you're able to adjust to fixed inputs. So when you have a fixed input and you can change it, it's now an investment decision. Okay, so any investment decision is when you have a fixed input, like a factory or a contract, and you're gonna renegotiate that new new contract, or you're gonna make a new factory, or downsize or upsize, whatever you choose to do. So you can change any input, quantity, or quality, even. That's the other thing with, with investment decisions. You can change quality. They often focus on quantity, but quality is very important because you might decide, hey, we're gonna stop making this product A, and we're gonna make B 2.0. And it's going to be a lot better. We're not going to be able to make as many of them, but we're going to be able to sell them for a lot. So you can change the complete product at that point. You can change what you're doing. In fact, most companies, you'd be amazed how many things they're making and how often they decide, okay, we're going to make this, not make this. We're going to go to the new product, or we might go back and produce a little bit of the old product for a short run. It gets really interesting, okay? Um, also, this is what's really big. Decide whether to enter slash exit an industry. You might just completely get out of the industry in, in general, okay, and go into a different industry. You could be making soda and decide, you know what, we're going to go ahead and go into cell phones. It's possible, okay. Usually you want to stick with what your skills are good at as far as your te technological skills and just your abilities to deal with technology. But there's a lot, of, a lot of companies that get into different industries as far as entering and exit. Um, I mean, take, for example, Sony. You have Sony Pictures, and they're an electronics company. And also, a lot of the time, these companies have financial arms and stuff like that. And so when you get these big conglomerate companies, they might slowly start to exit or at least pull back out of an industry and then focus more of their power in another part that they have that's doing well. Okay. Um, the side scale or size of the firm, we talked about that. Uh, accounting costs are the explicit cost of resources used by production. Okay, we're almost there. We're almost there. Just, just focus. We're there almost. Okay. Accounting costs are the explicit. So when we say explicit, that means I can tell you exactly what the cost is, okay? It's something we record, okay? It's an explicit cost. An accounting cost is something we record of resources used during production. So if I had a, a balance sheet of accounting in front of me, I would record that cost. So it includes out-of-pocket payments for resources used to external parties, okay? So if I actually have to do a transaction, it's out-of-pocket. I pay for it. It's explicit because there's actually money being exchanged. Okay, I can track the money. That's why it's an accounting cost. There's money to be tracked. Uh, accounting costs exclude the value of resources that do not require payment. So if I'm not exchanging money, then there's no accounting paper trail, even though there could be a change in value going on. Interesting. Let's take a look at this. Okay, a resource with an explicit cost still has an opportunity cost, okay? This is where we're gonna get into the economic difference. Implicit cost is the value of a resource used during production with zero explicit cost. Let me give you an example. Let's say I have a friend named Bob. Bob's a builder, surprise, surprise. Bob lets me borrow a bulldozer. Okay, there's, that's the alliteration for the day. Bob lets me borrow a bulldozer, okay? now. With that bulldozer, if I'm just borrowing it and he doesn't charge me anything, okay, I can then decide what I want to do with it, okay? So I could go ahead and I could loan it out to someone else and charge them money, okay? Or 
the implicit cost is what I else I could be doing with it that wouldn't cost any other money, and I could use the bulldozer myself to build something, okay? And so I'd have to look at, well, if I rent it out to someone else, maybe it, they pay me $100. Maybe I use the bulldozer, and I do a project that's worth $500, okay? The bulldozer in itself cost me zero because Bob's a nice guy and loaned it to me, okay? And so when I'm looking at this, you have to figure it out. It's like, oh, wait a minute. So the accounting cost, if I was to loan out, it's going to be 100 But if I was able to keep it and use it for something that I deem useful, maybe it could be $500 worth. Um, this stuff also isn't just resources, but a lot of times it deals with people's time and resources. So, for example, let's say I had a person working at a restaurant. And that, at that restaurant they're working at, they get paid, or the restaurant they're working at, Let's say they're making about $300 a month after all their expenses. They own the restaurant, okay? Let's put it this way. They own the restaurant. <clears throat> and so we go through, we do all the accounting, and we're like, hey, they should keep working here because they're, only, oh, they're, they're, they're making $300 a month. Well, what's the opportunity cost? Well, if they're barely making it by owning the restaurant, they could sell all that off, hire themselves out to someone else, and make $2,000 working for someone else. Well, now, instead of making $300 a month, they're really making, well, negative $1,700 because they could be loaning themselves out to someone else, someone who has a much better business plan, someone who already has customers, and then they're just getting high paychecks as chefs or whatnot, okay? And so even though we look at it and say, oh, look, you're making money on paper, how much money could you be making somewhere else, okay? That's why we're looking at opportunity costs, implicit costs, and, and oftentimes when we look at it, it's like, you don't pay yourself when you're working at the business, do you? You don't. You don't go ahead on the paper and say, "Well, and then I'm going to minus two thousand dollars my work at my own company." No, but is your work valuable? Yes, it's obviously valuable. And we, if we employ you by someone else, all of a sudden we see on paper, "Oh, you are actually worth two thousand dollars a month." So it makes sense to close that business if you're not got something going at some point. You're not able to get something going there. Just hire out yourself to someone else. Um. This restore still has a cost because it could have been used in another production process. So another production process. So going back to that example, you have the people who own the restaurant. They're barely scraping by. They're making $300 after all their costs. Okay. So they have all their costs accounted for. They have $300 net. They could shut that all down. And then they could go loan themselves out and work full time for someone else. And they'd have 2000 coming in. Okay. That's the opportunity cost. That's an economic cost. That's how you really evaluate decisions, okay? So how we look at this? Well, economic cost is the value of resources used during production. So economic cost equals explicit costs plus implicit costs, okay? You have to add those both up, and they often look at explicit costs as in counting costs. Uh, economic and accounting costs diverge whenever a resource is used with zero explicit cost. So, and that's when they're, when they're looking at it. It's like something that you normally would not put on paper, but obviously has value. So like an owner not paying themselves, things like that. Distinction between economic and accounting costs directly affects profit computation. So profit equals total revenue minus cost. Accounting and economic profits are analyzed by tracking explicit and implicit costs, okay? Like in that last example, I mean, at first, when if I, whenever I give these people, uh, people this presentation in class, I tell them, okay, I have a company, these people own, it costs them $4,000 in costs, and then profit or, or, their, or their revenue is $4,500, so they have a net profit of $500 should they stay in business. And every single time when I give that example, everyone raises their hand. Yes, they should stay in business. I'm saying, but that's the accounting cost or the accounting profit at that point. What's the economic profit or economic loss? Well, we have to consider what else they could be doing. They could loan themselves out as chefs make 2,000 net profit. Then we're looking at making 2,000 versus 500. There's now a $1,500 difference, okay? So we see a big difference going on there. Um, production decisions use economic cost. Okay, they're gonna look at how, how the resources are used. Uh, decisions include startup expansion, not producing the short run, and closing the business. Okay, that's the other thing too. When you have a business, you have life cycles. Some businesses run negative for the first start, especially tech companies, high venture companies. I mean, a lot of times what they're looking at is customer acquisition, like Facebook. Hey, we just want customers. Then we're going to make a lot of money. 
Google, same thing. I mean, sometimes the customers are the main thing you're looking at getting. Uh, currently, right now, another good example of that would be Movie Pass. They're running very neg. They're gonna they're gonna run very negative for a while. And I'll, I'll do a whole other segment on them. But basically, they're a company that you have once per day you can go see a movie at any theater you want, and only costs ten bucks a month. Okay, what are they trying to do? They're trying to capture all the people. Once they have them captured, they can then leverage that to talk with theaters and say, now let's do discount tickets and cut us in on the profit. Um, <laughs> there's a lot more on that article I could go over as far as movie pass, but that's a good example. Um, with a growing labor force, will diminishing MVP reduce our standard of living? Okay. Well, U.S. labor force continues to grow by more than a million workers per year. Additional workers strain production facilities, lower wages, and living standards. Okay, so when you have these additional workers, unless we have the fixed inputs to go along with them, we get bottlenecks. So that's strain production per worker. And if we're having strain production per worker, then we're having these lower wages, lower living standards. Okay. In other words, everything's okay as long as the new workers we're adding are equal to the capital investments we're adding. Okay, we must keep pace. Additional workers to offset diminishing MPP. So in other words, if we have this factory and all of a sudden it's made to fit at max 100 people, you know what we should do? If we have 200 people, get another factory. The only way to offset this to make sure we're economically viable overall is to make sure that we are not getting these, these production bottlenecks. People are able to have capital to match the workers in the in economy. We need to make sure this is available. When we do this, people are more efficient. We get more. And at some point, that efficiency... As we spread out the gains to some degree, it doesn't spread out equally, but as you spread out the gains, it helps the economy out a lot more. Um, outpaced diminishing MPP must increase productivity of all workers, okay? Increasing worker productivity. What does it take to increase worker productivity? Education and training. Okay, that's another thing. So capital investments as far as the actual place they're working, also the type of workers we have. More, most of our industries are becoming uh, capital intensive. You have one guy manning very expensive equipment, very expensive product. And so you're going to have to increase education, training, capital investment. Room productivity is synonymous with reducing cost. Yeah, so this is, the thing. this is the same word. If I reduce cost, it's the same thing as increasing productivity because I'm keeping the cost the same and increasing and producing more. Or I'm producing more at the same price, okay? Either way, you can look at it. It's the same. Then they're going to show you these little graphs over here as far as diminishing returns. So... You got resource inputs and you got rate of output. Basically the same type of graphs we looked at before. Okay. When the production function shifts up, guess what? We're becoming more efficient. Okay. And because if we're producing more with the same amount of, of stuff, that's the same thing as lowering our costs per. Okay. So ATC, see the ATC curve over there? If we're able to produce more units at the same cost... Well, that's going to spread out that cost per unit, which is average total cost. So you're going to see that curve shift down. And marginal costs are the same thing. And they just look at each step, and that line is going to shift down. Whenever you have an increase in production, so on the left, that increase in production, you'll see that that mirrored as far as if we're looking at cost curves going down. So if a production curve goes up, cost curves will shift down, and vice versa. If a cost curve shifts down, you'll see production curves shift up, okay, forever comparing the two they're the same thing and here is the summary okay we looked at production functions law of diminishing returns fixed versus very fixed versus variable and marginal costs okay and we looked at the difference between investment decisions which investment is a long run decision production is short run so again production short run investments long run discussed how on counting costs which are explicit meaning they can be recorded we record them are different than economic costs. Economic costs is how we have a resource we're not currently got on paper, and we depending on what we how we use it, it could have different value. And we go back to the people running their diner, struggling versus if they just became chefs at some other place. Um, hopefully this makes sense for everybody. It's great to have you here. Keep chugging through. You're doing good, okay? Keep up with economics. Good to have you guys all here. Keep learning. If you have any questions, comments, go ahead, put those in the in the comments below. Or you can message me later. Okay, everyone take care.